When I was in high school, my father began what he referred to as a project in our basement. He didn't specify what this project was exactly, only that it was strictly for business, and whatever happened down there was to be kept confidential. It would be off limits to everyone but himself. He even went so far as to have the basement walls soundproofed. Admittedly, I found it odd that his job would demand that level of secrecy. Otherwise, I didn't give it too much thought. Some of my friends at school were into all sorts of kinky and bizarre pornography, namely shock videos like Two Girls, One Cup. It wasn't uncommon to spend time on obscene porn sites in order to find such ridiculous bullshit. As for me, I never spent too much time on the internet. Typically, I would just look up NFL or NBA highlights, but not much else. Social media websites never appealed to me, and certainly not at all the weird shit my friends often looked up. One particular day, we were sitting at the lunch table, and my friends were talking about the latest they had seen in the world of strange pornography. As usual, I tuned it out when they brought it up. Then one friend named Kevin began to discuss what he called the dark web, and what he mentioned made all of the kinky stuff seem tame by comparison. Hitman websites, videos of animal torture and mutilation, realistic or possibly even genuine depictions of rape. He claimed he even saw links to child pornography, although he denied clicking on any of them. I admit what I heard actually piqued my interest. Could such a fucked up place truly exist on the internet? Kevin invited us for a sleepover on the weekend, at which point he would show us some of what he was talking about. We all agreed to come over. As he navigated us through the dark web, I saw he was telling the truth. We saw links to every awful thing he had described to us. He stumbled across a random untitled link that stoked up his curiosity. What do you think? Should we check it out? I said nothing but the rest of the guys all said yes. With that, Kevin clicked the link. The screen changed to show us a clock counting down. Apparently we had stumbled across a live stream. When the clock reached zero, we were greeted by a very dark room. For the first 30 seconds or so, all we could hear was heavy breathing. Eventually a small beam of light appeared, presumably from a flashlight, and illuminated some guy wearing a strange mask, a top hat, a suit, and a cape. His voice was distorted to prevent anyone from recognizing it. Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us. You may call me Hawkins. And boy, do we have a show for you tonight. A pair of helpless victims. With that, the rest of the screen was illuminated. It was a bright red room, very small and cramped. On the back wall, two women were locked up in wall-mounted cuffs. Both were completely nude. One of them obese and the other one very fit. It looked like some stereotypical dungeon in a horror film. As I would soon discover this was not a movie. Hawkins approached the obese woman. Oh, you are one ugly, disgusting bitch. Ugly bitches like you don't deserve to share the world with the pretty ones. He glanced at the other more attractive woman. Am I right? He asked. She said nothing. I have something special planned for you, but for now we deal with the ugly one. My friends and I all began to feel uneasy about what to expect. Garden shears, Hawkins shouted. A second pair of hands appeared from off screen and handed the masked man a pair of garden shears and he slowly crept up to the woman. A pity if only you were better looking, I might not have to do this. Suddenly he opened up the shears and began cutting into the woman's breasts, leading to a deafening scream from her and shocked gasps from me and my friends, one of whom started to vomit. Hawkins went down to her feet and tried to cut them off as well, but found it difficult as she had very thick ankles. No matter, Hawkins said calmly. Chainsaw? The unseen assistant handed him a chainsaw, and my heart sunk. He revved it up and slowly cut into her ankles, leading to more prolonged screaming and tears streaming down her face. The other woman began sobbing in terror as well. 
Hawkins' mask and costume became drenched in blood. After slicing off her feet, he started cutting into her abdomen, leading to her guts spewing everywhere. One of my friends passed out from the shock and the sight of this. Let her bleed. But as for you, he said moving toward the second woman. Whip. After receiving the whip, he walked up to her and gave her a number of brutal lashings. It was at this point when Kevin noticed there was a message box for the live stream, and people were typing all sorts of awful messages, all of them expressing glee at what they were seeing. Kevin typed in his own message. What the fuck is wrong with you people? The police will hear of this. I saw Hawkins unzip his pants and release the woman from her shackles. But before he could do anything else, his assistant spoke up. Hey boss, check out this message. Hawkins kicked the woman very hard in the stomach before walking over to the camera. Oh, a tough guy, eh Kevin? Gonna call the police on me, huh? All of us gasped when we heard the crazy masked man mention Kevin's name. No matter. I have all the information I need on you. Looks like I'll be seeing you soon. A box appeared showing Kevin's name, home address, and school. Kevin was frozen in terror. Now if you'll excuse me, I have business to attend to. It was here when Kevin shut off the computer. The rest of our friends bailed, but I chose to stay behind with him, even though I was also frightened out of my mind. Fortunately, nothing happened that night, but Kevin didn't get any sleep at all. A few weeks passed and it seemed what had taken place had blown over. That is until one Friday night. I was watching the local evening news when I heard a report of a mass homicide that had taken place not far from where I lived. I was horrified when I saw a reporter standing outside what I recognized as Kevin's house. Kevin was reported as missing while his parents and siblings were slaughtered. My God, they got him, I said to myself. During the night, I woke up to use the bathroom. As I walked out, I saw my father coming up the stairs, looking like he had just finished yard work. His clothing was covered in dirt. Dad, it's 1 a.m. What were you doing? I was fixing a busted sprinkler. At this hour? Why not? Is there some law that says I can't? Whatever, Dad. I sighed. I went back to bed and thought nothing of it until the next afternoon. My father had left the house to run some errands. It was here when I decided to be a naughty boy and check out the basement. I don't know why I suddenly decided right then and there to check it out, and I didn't usually have a rebellious streak, but fuck it. I wanted to see what the secrecy was all about. I go down the stairs and flip the light switch. So far, the basement didn't really look all that different from the last time I had set foot down there. Until I looked behind the staircase, and noticed something that definitely wasn't there before. A door. I opened the door and a light turned on automatically. What I saw made my blood chill. It was a room with red painted walls and wall mounted cufflinks. It looked identical to the room I had seen in that awful live stream weeks earlier. In a corner lay blood-stained garden shears and a chainsaw. On the wall next to the door was a desk with a computer and webcam. Next to it was a hideous mask, which I instantly recognized as the mask worn by Hawkins. I heard my father shouting upstairs when he noticed the basement door was open. He came down cursing at me and stopped in his tracks when he saw me standing in the entry of his secret room and holding the mask. His expression changed from anger to shock instantly. We stared at each other in awkward silence for a long time. That was until he broke down sobbing uncontrollably. I walked over and kicked him in the face and gut, then walked upstairs to call the police. My father was arrested shortly thereafter. He had soundproofed the walls to prevent the possibility of anyone's screams from being heard. Also, my friend Kevin and those two women in the live stream were buried in our backyard. Their bodies thoroughly dismembered and laid on top of one another. That explains my dad's late night yard work. 
as to why he took the name Hawkins for his dark web identity. Apparently there's a man buried in a nearby cemetery named Carl Hawkins, who was murdered back in 1995. The crime had gone unsolved for nearly 20 years. My father confessed to being his killer, and as it turned out, DNA blood evidence recovered at the scene back then was a match. The name Hawkins stuck with him because you always remember your first murder, as he put it. Five years have passed since his arrest and sentencing. I haven't paid him one visit in prison since then. Eventually he will receive the death penalty by lethal injection. I wish I could say I'm saddened by this. He's still my father after all, but I'm not. I can't believe the man who raised me turned out to be such a vile monster. I always believed him to be a principled and honored man. Obviously this is no longer the case. And now I'm left to wonder whether he passed on some kind of bad seed to me, and whether I too will one day snap and become the same kind of monster. One evening, I was looking for an internet cafe because I needed to send a few emails. I spotted one in an old building. The sign said it was on the sixth floor. When I walked through the entrance, there was a dark hallway that led to a small elevator. I pressed the call button and when the doors opened, I stepped inside. In a lot of Asian countries, many buildings do not have a fourth floor. The number four is considered bad luck because the word four sounds almost the same as the word for death. When it stopped and the doors opened, I was about to step out when I realized that something was wrong. The hallway was in total darkness. By the light emanating from the elevator, I could make out a random piece of furniture covered with white cloth. It looked like it hadn't been touched in years. I thought I might have gotten off on the wrong floor, so I checked the button, but none of them were lit up. There was nothing to indicate which floor I was on. Just then, I noticed something moving at the end of the darkened hallway. I couldn't quite make out what it was, but it looked like a person dressed in some type of gown. The figure was moving slowly down the hallway towards the elevator. It creeped me out and in a panic, I started pressing the closed door button. All of a sudden the light in the elevator flickered and turned off. I was plunged into the pitch darkness. I was so freaked out I almost wet myself. Just as I was about to lose it completely, the lights flickered back on. The doors closed. The elevator jolted back to life and began to ascend again. I breathed a sigh of relief. When the doors opened this time, I was at the internet cafe. I went over to the counter and told the girl who worked there and what had happened. As she listened, her face grew pale. She said that some of the customers and a few of her co-workers had experienced the same thing. She had never experienced anything herself, but she told me about the history of the building. Apparently, the fourth floor had been a hair salon at one time. It was prospering and doing pretty good until one of the women who worked there killed herself in the salon. Nobody knew the reason why. The salon continued to operate, but they were plagued by weird and inexplainable events. Sometimes when customers were having their hair washed, the water would turn as red as blood. Other people claimed that when they looked in the mirror, they would catch glimpses of a ghostly figure standing behind them. When they turned around, there would be no one there. Because of these events, the salon developed a bad reputation and began to lose customers. Eventually, they were forced to close down. The building's owner tried to rent the fourth floor out to other businesses, but when they found out what had happened, nobody would take it. Finally, the owner reduced the price to nearly nothing, and it was rented by a businessman who planned to open a stationary supply store. However, when they tried to do some renovations on the floor, there was a series of mysterious accidents. The workmen's tools would sometimes disappear, only to be found in the strange places. A large mirror suddenly shattered when nobody was near it, and the workman had his hand crushed when the elevator closed unexpectedly. Eventually, the workmen were so spooked that they refused to continue. The building's owner gave up trying to rent the fourth floor out and just shut it down. He had the buttons in the elevator replaced, and it was reprogrammed that nobody could go on the fourth floor. 
At least that's what's supposed to happen. For some reason, when people took the elevator, it would sometimes stop on the fourth floor, and when the doors opened, some people would see a figure coming toward them in the darkness. I honestly still don't know what that was. This story starts on a Thursday night in May of 2017. I work in retail, and after a long shift one night, I called an Uber home so I could avoid the dodgy people that hang around the train station. I wish I had known that this simple act of calling for transportation would lead to a six month long ordeal of harassment and obsession. I got into the car and chatted with the middle aged driver who I'll call T. He had a strong Turkish accent and seemed very friendly. The conversation was normal at first, with him asking where I worked and why I was out so late, what I was studying, etc. As the conversation progressed though, he began to make comments that started to make me feel uncomfortable. He started to comment on how pretty I was how young I looked and how he missed the times when he was young and could get with girls like me. Then he put his hand on my knee and patted it affectionately. He tried to push the hair out of my face. I was very aware that he was controlling a moving vehicle with me in it, so I just ignored him and prayed that we would get to our destination quicker. When he pulled up to our place, he noticed a car was in the driveway and immediately retracted his hand. He asked me if I wanted to go out for a coffee sometime. I politely declined, said that I had a partner. He told me that he was a lucky man and that I could call him any time for a free ride. He then reached out and kissed my hand. I felt physically sick, but thanked him for the ride and hopped out as quickly as I could. As soon as I was inside, I told my boyfriend what had happened and he encouraged me to report the driver. I was apprehensive at first as he knew our address, but eventually I reported it as I knew we were moving soon. I was reassured by Uber that the matter would be investigated thoroughly and received a full refund for the trip. I didn't hear anything from T after that and was soon busy into my own study schedule, working and moving house. I had forgotten all about him until around August or by chance I ran into him in our cafe. I was in line to get a coffee when he tapped me on the shoulder. My heart sank. He gave me a big smile and tried to give me a hug, which I declined. Hey, I've missed your pretty face. Where have you been? I'm super busy. Sorry, I can't really talk. I sputtered out. I ordered my coffee hastily and burst out the door with him hot on my trail. He started walking beside me, matching my pace. I was starting to breathe heavily and hyperventilate. Hey, so I could have bought you that coffee. We still need to go on that coffee date sometime. I told him no. I wasn't interested and that he was making me uncomfortable. He grabbed my hand as we were walking. What the fuck are you doing? He replied. Oh, is that too soon? Too soon? Too soon for what? We're not on a date and I'm not interested. Leave me alone. I said this loudly enough for people around me to hear me, and a few people had started to pay attention. Oh, are you a lesbian or something? No, I'm just not interested in you. I was mortified. I had officially lost it and started to cry. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. He tried to pat me on the back. I physically flinched and walked away from him, close to having a mental breakdown. He called out behind me as I was leaving. You still work at that shoe store, right? I realized then that I told him where I had worked that night, and that he had picked me up and seen me in uniform. I also told him where and what I studied. I couldn't believe my own stupidity. I alerted my store manager, who then alerted shopping center security. They assured me that they would be on the lookout. Sure enough. My first shift back after the cafe run-in, my manager told me that someone had come in asking for my phone number, and when I was next on shift claiming to be my boyfriend. My manager refused to give this information and immediately notified security, but by the time they arrived he had already left long ago. 
They showed me the grainy center security footage of people coming into our store around that time, and sure enough, it was T. I was told that if he came in again to go hide out in the back, and that the other girls on shift would deal with him. A few months later, he even tried to add me on Facebook. I immediately changed my name on Uber so I couldn't be identified anymore. I have a pretty unique name, and blocked him right away. The most recent incident happened in September last year. I was tidying the window display out the front of the store when I immediately felt like I was being watched. I looked to my left, and sure enough, T was there. I pretended not to know him, and just said, Can I help you with something, sir? Just admiring your beauty, he said with a smile. He then gave me an envelope and walked out before I could say anything. Inside was a card saying that he really felt a deep connection and thanking me for my help today, even though I never even served him. Inside was a voucher for the local bikini store for $100. I've included photos and blanked out the parts that might give my identity away. Anyways, I realize now is the time to involve the police, and I'm kicking myself for not contacting them in the first place. I haven't heard from him since, and I'm praying that I don't ever hear from him again. Should I still involve the police, even though it's been a while since we last made contact?